All right. Okay, so what we will do is we will start with some, some pointers uh, that I think are quite important. So uh, let me just change this for the Zoom people to see the classroom. All right, so um, let me just type it here. So the first thing is that um, the assignment had kind of a specification and the specification dictated certain things to be done certain way. And then it left certain things kind of unspecified. So you will, you will realize that that it's always the case. So when you're working and when you're doing something, even if you're doing something for your own project, you know, like if you have your own pet project, certain things you want to freeze, certain things you want to kind of specify quite precisely, and certain things are a little bit unspecified, and then you can organize them the way you want, right? So for example, um, the, first, um, the first thing, which is um, the structure, of code was not specified. It didn't dictate it like a template or it dictated like how you need to organize your functions. So you can organize the functions the way you want, right? And that makes sense. So it's up to you. And then you kind of logically organize your domain and you organize your code and that's fine. Um, so this is kind of a free choice. But for example, um, Error handling was also unspecified. So there was a situation where a user can enter a wrong data. And then, you know, what happens? Well, we said, yeah, the program can crash. Okay, you can panic. So if you were programming it in Rust, you could uh, say unwrap or you could say, you know, panic uh, every time something wrong happens. And then, um, you know, we, we don't care. So uh, handling errors is another one. Um, Free choice. Sometimes handling errors is specified and then you have to follow the specification. Uh, sometimes some of the structure of the code, like maybe you are refactoring and there is a method or function that is already in the system and you're changing some other things, but that method is a public interface and you need to keep it. So sometimes the first point is also specified, right? Um, handling errors is um, typically specified. Uh, in the assignment, we we kind of didn't care, but normally you should care. And that's the first one that when you're refactoring your code, you're sort of paying attention to and you're redoing. Um, so then um, the third one was IO. So the communication um, with the user or like, you know, we were using standard in and standard out. And that was specified. And the reason why it was specified is such that you can plug into programs to talk to each other, right? So if you don't specify it and you plug into programs and there are variations, then they will not understand each other, right? So that was kind of a clearly defined and that was specified. And um, it was specified that the moves are kind of done by um, an index let's say followed by an optional uh, rotation and the rotation was specified to be left. Um, yeah. Uh, and all right, right. So it was uh, index followed. Well, I, I didn't specify it as a formal grammar, but if we were to kind of make it a little bit more formal, we would say, um, it's some sort of a numerical index and then left or right, right? And that was specified and that you should follow, right? So some of you uh, follow that, some of you choose L or, uh, or R and that's fine, but that would, not, that would mean the programs can't talk with each other, right? Uh, because they expect left or right. Um, so that, that was not free choice here. Um, then there is a problem of index, so, you know, the usually our data structures index everything from zero, but for the choice, for the sake of the user, we decided, okay, we will index everything from one. Um, and then you have this sort of a translation problem. So you need to adjust it. 
you could say um, we will index it for the user from zero, but the specification clearly said we doing it from one, right? So you have to do it from one. Um, what will happen if the user enters the wrong thing? Well, that was not specified, right? So uh, some of you crashed the program, some of you handled it into nothing or ignored it, or you know it, it doesn't uh, doesn't matter. So um, that was uh, so some some things with the communication with the user were clearly specified, some were not. Um, why do we? Um, okay, so then um, yeah, the final thing uh, was the win loss condition uh, and the and the message and that one so most of you did this point well uh, only some uh, i didn't check everybody yet but um I, i've seen some by uh, variations and then almost everyone made some variations here right exclamation mark or a dot or something like this right what does it mean well it means that when a, another program reads the the the, the final message they will not be able to parse it because the specification said it needs to be game over followed by who and or, or followed by a draw right so we were kind of expected a, a certain pattern right so there was no free choice here neither um and you may say yeah what well, does it matter right if you are not implementing program to program then it doesn't matter like for a human whether there is an exclamation mark or not it doesn't matter but for a program it matters right so it, it's like it's not a big deal it's just a small detail but those details kind of accumulate right so the, the main point here is that if you make kind of a small variations out of the specification and you have the specification specified you yourself like in two months or three months when looking at the code or your co-workers checking the code and looking at the specification there will be a mismatch and you will not remember why there is a mismatch is the code right or is the specification right? Like, you know, what should it be? Um, and those little things kind of um, snowball and they accumulate. And that is kind of an important aspect in programming. Like you can't let those small things to accumulate because you end up with a mess. You end, end up with the, those kind of spaghetti, you know, uh, complexity problems. Um, you have to sort of uh, keep nudging things such that they are more or less in that zone where you're kind of uh, in, in full control of it, right? So that was the um, the main uh, the main points. And the question is, why do we? Um, yeah, I kind of answered it. Like, why do we do this? Why do we? Why are we trying to be precise? And the reason is that we're trying to be precise for the for making our life easier. Uh, for making our maintenance easier and for kind of communicating with the rest of the team. Um, and this is kind of the main main point, which is kind of hard to, to explain. And when I was a student, like the, when I was learning programming, the, the teachers were trying to sort of teach me that, but I didn't get it. Um, but eventually you will get it. So um, programming is social. So programming is a kind of a social activity. It comes from engineering. And then when you are engineer, you're always seeking kind of a, a good solution, a, a proper solution. And it doesn't matter if you came up with it or somebody else came up with it. It's like you, you're trying to find something that is kind of concise and communicate what it needs to communicate. And it kind of solves the problem in a, in a nice way. And you can't do it yourself. So you have to learn it from others and others are learning from you and you sort of building it together. So even if you're working on the code yourself, even if it's your own project, you are checking Stack Overflow, you're checking books, you're checking tutorials, you're checking other people code for those little problems that you have. And it's already social, like you're alone, you're doing your own project, but you're not alone. You, you're sort of benefiting from the knowledge and know-how of, of other people. And this is kind of the important point that you should do that. You should do as much of it as possible uh, because then you will be finding those better solutions, those sort of um, patterns that are better suited for the task at hand that you have. So um, in the spirit of this, um, of this final close, uh, what we will do, we will kind of look into the code that we did uh, for assignment one and try to sort of discuss a little bit um, what patterns did we use and 
what could be improved and why we made certain choices, okay? So often we make choice because we have a time pressure, right? So we want something done and we just want something to work. And we don't care whether it's beautiful or whether it's concise or whether it's like done very well and maintainable. We just want something to, something to work. And that's fine. That's kind of one criteria that you often have. And you will often have it in your commercial life when you delivering solution to a deadline. Uh, and you have to have, you have to cut some corners, okay? Um, when you learning and when you're trying to learn and trying to improve your skills, sometimes we do those kata, which is we don't want something just to work. We want something to work in a kind of a nice way, something that we like, something that we feel is you know, somehow appropriate solution for a problem that we have. Um, and then we, we are not in a hurry. We can kind of uh, tinker in our head of how to organize it, how to do it. Um, and that's um, some of those exercises, some of the assignments are kind of about that. It's not about just having something done, it's about having something done in a way that you like, that you are improved, right? Um, I often write code that just works first and passes tests. And then I sort of refactor it to make it shorter or more concise or more maintainable or nicer. And you, you kind of do it in two passes or three passes sometimes, right? Um, so getting something done and some, something passing the tests it's good because then you kind of conceptually understand the problem better. If you haven't solved it yet, it, you know, that's the first step. First step is to solve something. And then you can kind of refactor it and rethink how you can solve it better. All right, so before we, uh, before we do that, um, there will be a lecture on, um, there will be a separate lecture on programming um, patterns, uh, but I wanted to highlight um, just, couple uh, here, which are typically used in object-oriented programming, but um, in Rust or in Haskell, we kind of don't really need them because we're using different paradigm. So I don't want to talk about paradigms today, but um, can you give me some example patterns that you know from object-oriented programming or C++ that you've used um, such that we can kind of discuss it a little bit here. So one, one kind of a pattern that everybody knows is singleton, right? So singleton is a construct that allows you to sort of share state across multiple classes without passing it all over, right? So normally, if you have some sort of state, you have to make it a parameter to your methods or to a class constructor such that you can pass it all around. But in game or in some systems, like, you know, if you have a system keyboard, uh, we kind of don't do that. So in, in Java, for example, you have a system out, right? Uh, out is the output stream and system is system out is kind of like a singleton which says, okay, everybody can use it because it's just this one thing, right? And I have one, one kind of instance of it. Um, but it like in, so, so singleton is one pattern that, that you know, um, it is, by some people considered anti-pattern really because it is forcing you to have a global state and global state like global variables is kind of not you know, um, not really nice. But then again, if you were to be passing the standard output everywhere in your Java code, that would make your code much more complex. So there are trade-offs, right? You should not abuse it, but you know, there are situations where singleton is useful. Uh, so how, how you do singleton in object-oriented programming, you know how you do singleton in Rust or in, um, or in Haskell? Well, you declare something in a global scope, right? So you have something that is accessible from everywhere. You make something public and you say, okay, I have, um, I don't know, I have um, uh, boss, right? And boss is uh, a person. And then you say boss equals something, right? And then if you do, this is like Haskell code, and if you do boss in a global state, then everybody can access boss and use it, right? It's kind of like a constant. Um, if you want a lazy evaluation for it, that's a different story, uh, but let's not dive into that. So that's one. Um, what's, what is another pattern that you often use? Yeah. 
Do you know, uh, yeah? Inheritance, yeah. So inheritance is not really a pattern. It's like, a, um, it's a mechanism from object-oriented programming where you can uh, derive some of the behavior, right? So inheritance, that's kind of a slightly different category, but let's say inheritance. And then what we do in Rust and what we do in Haskell is we have um, traits in Rust and we have uh, type classes. And in general, um, in Golang, for example, we have interfaces. So you can kind of benefit from the shared behavior using traits or type classes or interfaces without really using inheritance, right? So uh, yeah, so maybe in the preamble we have, um, so again, um, without going really into details, programming with behavior and state, and then programming with state and behavior as separate. So in C++, we mix state and behavior together. We have classes, which encapsulate some state and some behavior. And then we model our person to be some sort of um, a data structure. So for example, we, we say uh, we have a class person, and then we have some, here we'll have some properties, some attributes, and here we'll have some behavior, right? Um, and we kind of do that in the same concept, the same scope. Uh, and then that in itself is a little bit problematic sometimes because you need to kind of uh, find out what makes a person person and what behavior kind of should be here, right? Um, so that's kind of the model A, right, here. Uh, model B is, model B says, no, 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 you should split it. You should talk about attributes and data separately, and you should talk about behavior separately such that you can keep adding behavior or keeping behavior flexible such that depending on what you need, you kind of can have it, can not have it, can add it, can you know, expand it, can you know, expand the particular behaviors you have on top of person, right? So in Rust or in Haskell, if I have some struct um, and I need to add some processing on top of it, I can kind of always add a function which takes a person as a um, um, argument and add behavior to it, right? Um, oops. So um, with the model B, uh, we have this kind of a different mechanisms for doing inheritance. But yeah, in inheritance and interfaces, it's kind of a nice thing. So how do we do interface in uh, Haskell? So in Rust, it's kind of uh, relatively straightforward, but um, in, in Haskell, how would you do an interface? So let's say you want, um, so let's say we have this um, person. Um, so we have a person and the person has um, name. Okay, so it's some sort of record. It has an ID, name, whatever, age doesn't matter. And then we want to have an interface which allows us to uh, get person by ID. And it takes, so it takes an ID and returns us a person. Well, in C or C++, you have to have a function which does that. It's the same here. So if I say, okay, I have, um, I have a, a function which takes an ID. Um, so this is a, uh, of type ID uh, and returns me a person, then that is my interface, right? I have a type uh, which is uh, get person uh, and that get person is a function which takes, so I would say, yep, I have, a type which is a function which takes ID and returns me a person, right? Uh, and that's interface. And that's very generic interface because I don't say um, where this person comes from. So for example, if I have um, get person by ID from database, 
then I would have to give it an ID and I will have to give it some sort of um, database handle, right? And then it would give me a person, right? Um, that is, that's a different interface to this one. So this one only takes an ID and gives me a person. This one takes an ID and the database and gives me a person, right? So how, uh, what is the relation between these two? That one, the first one is more generic, right? So the first one is more generic and I can make it work in such a way that I either take a DB or I have something in memory or I have a list in memory and so on, right? So what I can do is I can um, use this one everywhere in my code, like everywhere where I need to kind of obtain a user, I can pass a reference to some you know, function which takes an ID and a person. But then what I can do is I can actually do this. I can uh, convert it into, the, the, the brackets are just for, um, for explanation. They are not needed, but if I have a, a function which generates me this function, I can pass it a DB handle and get the reference to that function and then use it everywhere else, right? And I can do the same. Um, so I can have, have another one like get a person by ID mock. And then this one can take whatever, you know, um, a list or a hash map or whatever I, I need to mock it from. And it will also return me a function which takes an ID and a person. And then again, I can use it everywhere in my code, right? Do you understand that? So it, it is kind of a way to generalize uh, something that you normally hard code into something that is more robust and then separates you from the details of the implementation, right? So this, this interface separates you from the details of how you are actually getting it. Are you getting it from a REST service? Are you getting it from a database? Are you getting it from a mock? Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, you just know that given, you know, given an ID, that function will give you a person. How it happens is hidden from you, but you can kind of easily implement it by having kind of utility functions, which take a particular persistent storage or per particular thing and give, gives you back that, that interface, right? Um, and that kind of separates you from the details of the implementation. All right, so when we already have it, let's talk a little bit about this. So um, if I say, uh, again, it's a bit of a Haskell code, um, but yeah, it's pseudocode. So what is wrong with this, with this struct? So if I say get age from user, and that function um, returns me an IO int, okay? Um, so will I know that the age is correct? What if the user entered minus one? So the problem with this is that I don't communicate um, constraints on, the, on, the, on my data, right? And then I will have to deal with it in my code. So everywhere in my code, I will have to deal with the situation that the age might be invalid, right? I might have an, an invalid uh, age. So let's make it a little bit more complicated and say I have an email here as well, right? Um, so what if the email is a string, but it's not really an email, right? Uh, emails have to have some sort of format so like, you know, someone at something dot something. Um, and if my string is not like this, if I have a string, you know, like this, that's not an email, right? Um, so that's one problem. The other problem is even if it is valid email, uh, what if the email is not validated yet? So I need to distinguish kind of uh, users having validated the email or not. So what I, what you could do is you could say is email validated and have a kind of a bool flag, right? But then um, you like, 
when you are kind of passing email around, you will not know if the email was validated or not, only from the person, like you will have to have those checks, those if checks everywhere as well, right? So there are some, some kind of problems here, um, which you could solve in Haskell or in Rust by making the types a little bit more strict, right? So I already made the type ID strict because I cannot have rubbish as an ID. It has to be an ID, right? Uh, I can do the same here. So I can say, okay, name needs to be a name. And then I have a mechanism for validating the name. We discussed that before. Same for the age. So if I change that to age, and if I do this to return me an age, then I know I cannot have minus one because I put some constraints of what age means, right? And then you communicate to whoever is reading this code saying, okay, age is not just any int, is a specific int with a particular range or whatever constraints you have. Uh, the same here, you can say, okay, I have a concept of an email and then email has to have this particular pattern. Uh, if it doesn't, then it cannot be an email. It is just a string and I have a distinction, right? So every function which takes email as a parameter now is guaranteed to have a particular constraints fulfilled. Um, so this, um, we have this um, this Boolean condition um, in this particular case, but often in our code, we have to deal with uh, some sort of uh, conditional execution. Like we have to decide, do we do this or that, right? And we um, use a, a Boolean flag. Um, you can encode it, um, um, you can encode it in the type system itself such that you can use enum or um, um, type. So if I use kind of a Rust notation, so let's say we have an email and the email is, um, uh, I, let's, let's keep, keep Pascal notation. So if I say email is um, verified, and then it has a string or it is um, not verified and it has a string, right? Then I can distinguish what type of email I already have uh, such that I can um, check, like I can dispatch for the verified or unverified situation, right? Uh, you could, you could do it this way, or you could say, okay, I have an email and I have, which is, you know, you kind of specify what email is, but you can also say, I have a verified email. Um, and then a verified email is something else, right? And then here you can have uh, an email field and verified email field, or you can have, again, um, you can have uh, a type which is, um, so you can have a, a row email, which is not verified. And then you can have an email, which is either verified or uh, row, right? And then you can kind of, in your code, you can dispatch it. Well, you may say, yeah, that's a lot of work. Like, why are we doing all of this, right? Um, if I have a very simple problem, why I, I need to add all this machinery here? Um, and the answer is for very simple problems, you don't. But if you're doing something more complex, you will have to have in your code those if statements. You will have to have those validators and those conditional checks for things to go wrong. You will have to have error handling. And that will complicate your code, right? So sometimes doing that makes everything else much simpler because you just don't need to deal with it. Like it, it is sort of taking care in one place in your code and then everything else is kind of sorted. All right, so um, those are kind of just some suggestions of how uh, we can deal with the, um, with the domain modeling with some of the patterns and some of the things in, um, in Haskell and Rust. So let's have a look into the, um, some of the patterns that we've used in the, in the assignment. So I have the, 
I have the code. So let's just split it such that I have two panels. So um, the way it works is I kind of extracted um, randomly uh, code from some of your submissions and I put them side by side such that we can compare slightly different approaches, right? Uh, and then we can kind of compare it to what I thought. It doesn't mean what I thought is the best, it, it may not be. Uh, and also what you thought might be okay or might be improved or whatever. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to be kind of showing that we have to do things certain way. It, it depends. It depends on the style. It depends on the requirements. It depends on the objectives and so on, right? I'm just trying to kind of explore slightly different uh, ways of, of doing things. So um, I've organized my code. Okay, so first of all, some of you um, organize your code into the lib and into the main. And you know the problem was simple enough that that's fine. Okay, I, I don't think you do need to split it into multiple files. Um, some of you kept lib with the domain specific things and then the main with some IO functions and game functions. That's fine, that makes kind of sense. Uh, some of you kept main very small and kept everything in lib. And some of you split the logic into some sort of files. Um, as I said, I, I don't think there is kind of a one solution here. Um, I think the problem was small enough that uh, having everything in a single file makes sense. Uh, and then if you have a single file, calling it lib is fine. Um, but if you were to split it into multiple files, then it kind of makes sense to use some logical uh, names such that you know you group your logic into the into those files. Um, so I did. I decided to to split it. I started with a single file, but as it grew larger, I kept scrolling back and forth, and I thought, yeah, I I don't want to keep scrolling to find the functions. I so I, I separated it. Um, and I separated it in such a way that I had uh, two um, files which contain most of the logic, most of the pure functions that I deal with. And then I try to co combine all the IO things separate because testing IO functions is a bit harder. Uh, it is possible, but it's cumbersome and it's a little bit harder. So I try to keep it separate and try to keep it small such that I can test all the logic uh, as pure functions. Uh, and then I had uh, sort of the AI module as a separate thing such that I can plug in and substitute or make it more complex. Uh, most of you that I've checked, you've used the random selection out of the, for the next move. Uh, and that was, um, yeah, that, that's the default best um, way of handling it. Um, but if you, and, yeah, so, so when, you, when you did that, um, most of you hard coded it into kind of the game logic. And then if you want to modify it, it's hard because it's kind of hard coded there. Uh, if you kind of extract it and make it separate, then it's easier to change it without affecting the rest of the code, right? Uh, again, do you need to do that? Well, you don't. It's, it's again, a, a simple problem such that you can always refactor it later. Yeah. That that's a good point. So that, that is unavoidable, especially because you are using the uh, because uh, you're using the random number generator, right? So because we we have to do a random number, then you have to be within the I/O monad. Uh, but you can kind of do that by um, you know, using the IO monad. So the, the way I've done it is I kind of take uh, a game context and I re, um, return a move which is wrapped around an IO monad such that I can use it in a, my main function by extracting the move out of the IO, right? Um, yeah, but that, that is a good point. All right, so let's, uh, let's have a look into the, uh, the model itself, right? So um, what I decided to do is I decided to make some constants for what is the middle position, what is the size of the row, and what is the size of the board. 
uh, such that I don't hard code any numbers, right? Uh, some of you did the same. Uh, most of you hard coded the, the number three somewhere, right? Or number nine. Um, again, yes, you should not have magic numbers in your code. You probably should use a constant uh, because then if you want to make it like, you know, five by five, for example, then you have to change a lot of your code. And a lot of your code depends on the number three. But then again, my code depends on the number three as well. So at some point I, I have like the, the matching function and it assumes uh, certain things, right? So um, I didn't win everything by having constants, but you should consider using constants every time you have to put a number or text in, right? Um, okay, and then uh, I modeled the, um, the mark or the, the kind of the cell as a specific type. And most of you did the same. So there is um, a particular implementation here, uh, which also models the, the move X and, uh, and O. Uh, there is another one which is identical to me. Um, and there is some that did a simplest thing, which is just modeling the board as a kind of a, list of characters, right? Um, there are some advantages of doing that. One of which is simplicity. It's like, uh, okay, it's super simple. Like, you know, I just have this compared to more complex machinery, right? Um, so um, there are some obvious benefits from that. What is the drawback? What is the drawback of doing a board just as a string? That's right. So you can have invalid boards, right? You, you have no guarantee that the board is a valid board. Um, and you, you have no guarantee that there are X and O's inside. You don't know how to handle the empty cells. Like all this information is not communicated. Um, so do you need to communicate all this information? Well, it depends. Like, in this particular case, the problem was so small that it usually fit in a single file such that the next developer who is reading that can kind of contain everything in, the, in their head. And it's probably okay. It's kind of a borderline, right? But if that problem got, gets bigger, if you want to add functionality to your, uh, to your code, then it will kind of snowball. It will become harder and harder, right? So for the assignment, I consider it a, a valid approach. If we added more functionality to it, or we keep adding more functionality, that may not be the best way of dealing with the domain, right? Um, okay, uh, question. How should we deal with the empty cell, right? So re, uh, modeling X and O's um, as X and O's, that's, that's fine. The, almost everyone agrees to do that this way, right? But there are kind of a two ways of dealing with an empty cell. One is to do it like I did or like uh, that person did, such that you model empty cell specifically, or another one which is a little bit like this one, where we model it as a separate entity. So, so here we say, okay, a move can be either X or O, uh, but the cell is either full with a particular move or it's empty. And then you could also use a maybe type, right? So you could say, I have a move, which is X on O, and then a cell is maybe move, right? So it's nothing if there was no move or a move if it was move, right? Um, so what are the advantages and disadvantages of modeling it this way or the, the other way? Yeah. The state of the cell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So I kind of like the, um, like to me, the nicest way would be to do it this way, uh, such that we have a move, which is X or O, and then the cell is a maybe move, right? And then the cell will be nothing, will be empty if there is no move yet. 
or it would be a XOO if there was a move, right? That would be the nicest way to do it. And I actually started like this, but then there was one reason why I didn't. And the reason was that I wanted to have um, the show uh, function. I, I wanted to have my types uh, be working well with the show function. So have a kind of a show type class implementation. And then for a maybe move, um, that's not just a normal type, it's a kind of a rope type. And to implement um, to implement a show instance on maybe something, it's a little bit cumbersome in, in Haskell. You can do it, but it involves having some uh, compiler flags and it was not as natural to do as it is for the normal types, right? Uh, and I decided, well, I kind of prefer to have the show for my X and O and empty cells without dealing with this extra thing, right? Uh, so it was kind of a balance and I made the decision based on the language, not on what would be the nicest thing to do, right? And we often do that. So when you're programming in Rust or in Golang or in other languages, sometimes you know what would be the, the nicest way of modeling something or doing something, but because of the language or because of the efficiency of like typing stuff, it's not even the performance of, of your implementation. It's, it just has to do with the, uh, you know, how much typing you have to do. Uh, you sometimes pick a, a option which is not the best, right? You're kind of balancing that. Um, but I, I would, if I were to redo it, I would probably try to redo it with the maybe and with the move as, as uh, you suggested, because that separates what is the move and what is the cell state. And then it communicates very nicely what, what is what, right? And then using nothing for the empty cells makes sense, right? It's just that you need to print those nothing, empty cells when you're displaying the board. And then you have to kind of deal with this nothing case, right? Uh, when I have this, uh, I kind of deal it here and then I don't need to think about it because it prints what I want it to print, right? Okay, so that leads us to the to the printing the board situation. So um, we have uh, printing the board using show, uh, and most of you did use type class for this, right? And it's nice uh, because then you just say show, and you know it, it it is very consistent with the rest of the language, right? Um, so here is another type class uh, and. Kind of the, the show implementation forces you to do this pattern matching and it, it is kind of readable and, and quite nice, okay? And then, so that's for the marks, that's for the individual cells. And then you need to show the entire board, okay? And that gets a bit in, more interesting. So um, I didn't do it the nicest way. Uh, where is the print show board? Yeah, here. So I did it in a kind of a, um, a mixture of pattern matching on the argument and the recursive um, recursive call to the board, right? Um, I didn't use the intercalate and I didn't use uh, some kind of a nicer features. I kind of just brute force concatenated it with the, uh, with the empty space and um, I used um, I used unlines so I, I split it into two functions. So one is just uh, generates um, rows as list. So it's a list of rows. And then um, I kind of fold it by concatenating it and kind of doing the unlines at the end, right? So if you use intercalate and if you use unlines, you can kind of uh, avoid concatenating it yourself, it kind of uh, leave it to the, uh, to the machinery, right? So here is, for example, uh, one implementation which is using intercalate um, and it kind of combines both the uh, splitting rows and putting the, the end of lines on, on, on the rows, right? So that's kind of a, a much more concise and nicer implementation because, you know, in uh, effectively in a single line or two lines, uh, that that person kind of combined what I have in like um, 10 lines, right? And two functions. So the complexity of dealing with this is nicer than my implementation here, right? Um, 
And then there are some other implementations. So for example, yeah, render row, render board. So some of you uh, split the logic into rendering row by row. Uh, so you deal with the, you know, uh, the entire board, and then you say, okay, I need to split it into the into the, the rows, and then you render each row separately, like for example, here. So this is kind of a very verbose uh, splitting of the board into three rows, uh, and then rendering them line by line. Um, yeah, there is nothing really wrong with the code, but there is a bit of a, repeti a repetitiveness, right? So you see that there is a pattern, like you use this uh, three times, um, and you could probably do the same with a map and kind of re remove some of the complexity, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, um, yeah. So if you have to repeat something three times, I start thinking, okay, uh, do I really need to do that, right? Uh, if I have to repeat something twice, I usually say, okay, uh, I just do it, right? Uh, but if you start repeating something more than two times, yeah, maybe you can kind of make it a little bit better. Um, so like, like this person did here. Um, so using a map and kind of, uh, splitting the uh, the board into rows, rows. Uh, you may need a little bit of an extra machinery. Maybe you need a, an extra function, but yeah, as, again, um, I'm, I, it's okay. It's readable. Uh, the only small problem is the constants, right? Magic numbers. Why, why three is here? What is the three, right? If you have a constant and it says uh, size of the row, and it says take size of the row from the board, it communicates exactly what it is, right? Here, yeah, okay, we know we're playing tic-tac-toe on three by three board, but, you know, putting magic numbers, yeah, you, you can probably improve that. Okay, so then, um, then we have uh, some uh, extra implementations such that, um, so instead, like, for example, here, this person takes a uh, splits the um, splits the uh, the board into rows by doing take and, and drop, but you can kind of do that uh, with the uh, yeah that, that one is also take and drop. Um, you can use some pattern matching, um, and I've seen some implementations kind of doing a pattern matching instead. Same thing, uh, no big no big difference. All right, so this code, what do you think about that? So th this is what we discussed uh, at the beginning that you have um, a conversion between uh, the zero base index and one base index, right? Uh, and then the, um, that particular person needed to convert what the user enters into the, um, into the index of the, of the internal representation of the list. So this function is needed and it, this function serves two purposes. So one purpose is it kind of makes an input validation because if there was an error, if the user entered some rubbish or if the user entered something that is not from the range of numbers that we expect, uh, then we return nothing, right? Uh, so the, this line introduces the input validation and then the rest of the lines make the conversion from the string to the to the number, right? Um, yeah, I would not write this because that would exceed my threshold of repeating myself more than twice, <laughs> right? So at this line of code, I would say, shit, I'm not typing the rest six rows of, of this code because it's just so repetitive. Um, well, it, it's not a bad code, right? I mean, it's very clean. Uh, you know exactly what this code is doing. It's just that you have to do a lot of typing, right? Um, and how could you how could you improve it? How could you make it simpler? Suggestions? So. Okay, so um, board index. So this board index takes uh, some input and produces uh, maybe int, right? 
Um, so take some inputs. We already have the type. So, okay. So first things to notice is that all those lines, all those lines basically do uh, conversion from the number to the to a number minus one, right? So what you could do is you could say, okay, I will read input. And because we have to handle the, the nothing, the error condition. So instead of just saying read, what you could do is you could say read maybe, uh, and then you, you would say um, read maybe from the input and that will give me an int, um, actually maybe int, right? So, <clears throat> So if I do this and I say do, and I say let, um, okay. So in Haskell, we often can combine multiple things that we do in a single line of code. And people complain that, yeah, that makes the code concise, but it makes code hard to read. So for example, when we have, uh, <clears throat> when we have things like this, okay, uh, there is, quite a lot of going on, right? Uh, and you kind of need to under, un analyze it and understand what is going on, right? Um, if you have something like this, this is kind of short enough that you can kind of understand like immediately what's going on with more complex things. It's a little bit harder. Uh, and then what you can do is you can split, um, you can split your logic into lines as you do in imperative programming to kind of have intermediate variables, let's say, uh, which kind of uh, explain to you what, what is happening, right? So what we can have, we can have uh, a number here. Um, no, actually that, you know, maybe, um, maybe uh, input will give us a maybe int. And um, then what I can do is I can extract, um, I can kind of extract the value out of this. Uh, and then, so I can do this. Um, and then if this line doesn't work, it will return nothing, right? So if maybe, maybe uh, if um, the read maybe will try to read an input with this particular type. So it will try to read it as int. And if it fails, it will return nothing. And because I'm doing it in the do statement, it will shortcut the error and it will just return nothing, right? So this line kind of converts me, uh, it, it converts um, all those 10 lines into um, a value or nothing which will be returned. And then I just need to return value minus one, right? Um, so now I'm basically doing the same thing, uh, but I reuse the, um, the kind of a shortcut logic of if I'm doing this line and if it fails, which means like read maybe returns nothing, then I don't continue my, my do statement. I just return nothing and that's it, right? That deadline will, will not evaluate uh, because this line will evaluate. Uh, if this line is not nothing, it has something, then the something will be the value. And then I basically uh, return value minus one because that's what, what we do here, right? Um, so this code is more concise and, and more readable and I spend less time typing. Yes, I spend more time thinking, right? I had to think about this a bit more and I need to remember that there is this read maybe function which I can use. Uh, this, this one doesn't make any external dependencies and it's like in your face, right? Uh, yeah, so as I said, like I, I don't really see anything like, you know, um, But I wouldn't do it this way, right? I, I would do it this way. Um, what do you think? Like, is that, what, what, what would you do? So obviously the person who did that, did that. that that's fine, right? That's a choice. Uh, but is it like, there is a trade-off, right? There is no single answer, which is the best, right? That one, first of all, makes no external dependencies. Second of all, it's in your face. Like it's exactly telling you what's happening. Like you don't need to think much about this, right? But 
you have to type a lot and you make you can make typos right like to to validate this method like i actually checked it if there is no error right and to make sure that there is no error you have to read line by line and check if this number is by one less than this number and you have to do it nine times right it's a lot of work to check if this method is correct right I, I spend maybe uh, you know 10 seconds or 15 seconds just checking these methods. Okay, so there are some positive and some negative things, right? Uh, positive things about this one is okay, less typing. Uh, I am sure that this number is less by one because it's it says here that it's less by one, right? It cannot be anything different. I cannot make a typo here, right? Uh, but it makes an external dependency and you kind of need to think a little bit more about it, right? Uh, so what would you say? Which one wins? I don't know, right? It kind of depends. It depends a little bit on the style and it depends what, like how, how much time really you need to think about this read maybe, right? If you're using it every day, if, if it's something that it's so familiar to you, reading this will be even easier than reading this. But if this is a bit unfamiliar to you, and if this you're not familiar with this kind of pattern, then yeah, maybe it's a little bit harder, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's what I said uh, at the very beginning that this method does um, actually it does three things, right? So it checks the parsing. Uh, if the parsing fails, it returns nothing. So this method does this as well, right? Uh, second of all, it, it converts this number to minus one, which this method does as well. So now those two features are kind of covered by this method. But this method also makes this input validation. So if number is correct, but it's larger than nine, it's not suitable for the board, right? And this method checks it. This method doesn't check it yet, right? So for, for this method to check it, I would have to add an, an if statement saying, okay, if value is, yeah, so that, that's a very good point. So I would have to say, if value is less than 10, return this, um, yeah, and, you know, uh, value also needs to be larger than zero. Uh, else, um, yeah, return nothing, right? So I would need to do this. Um, so I would probably do that with when. Um, yeah, but, but that would make the code a little bit more complex, right? Um, I don't want to actually spend time on like what I would do. I was just wanting to kind of point that point that out. All right, so um, let's move on. So the next thing is, um, yeah. So so then again, like for example, here uh, you see that this person separated the parsing of the um, of the input from the user into an int and then uh, use the int to obtain this, this int minus one kind of index into the, into the list. Um, that brings us to this kind of um, like, what should you do where and how, right? So this method does those three things in a single method. Uh, and this is kind of a combined. What if it changes? Like what if we now playing on a board, which is five by five? Okay, you need to modify this method, right? Um, because this method includes kind of a more complex logic. So in object-oriented programming and, and, and any programming, there is this uh, single responsibility principle, right? So you should try to make functions to be responsible for one thing, uh, not to combine too many things, because then if you do, then your code is kind of a more integrated and then any modification and a change kind of impacts your code, right? So the single um, single um, responsibility principle suggests that you should make your functions relatively simple and responsible for just one thing, right? Um, that function is a bit um, better in a sense because it already has the int parsed, 
and presumably this int is valid, right? Because if this int is invalid, then the logic would kind of uh, fail. Like if I go outside of my range, you know, my program will crash. Um, so presumably, again, this int is valid, but I don't know that, right? So again, we're going back to the first discussion that we had, how you communicate constraints to the user. So is this int valid or is this int invalid? Should I check this int? Should I validate if this int is within range here? This person is not doing any range validation, which means suggests that maybe this int is valid, but I don't know, right? So again, like that's, so in, in my implementation, that's uh, one thing that I also, like if we go to the board, um, where is my board? Yeah, anyway, so I, I have like here, um, for example, I'm, uh, no, let's do the board. So yeah, here. So the board is a list of, um, a list of marks, but every time I need a position, I'm using an int. So for example, here, empty positions returns a, a, a list of ints. Right? I didn't model a position as a separate type. I've used an int as a modeling the index. And again, that was not designed by the domain. It was designed by the language. It's just easier to use an int for, because then I can do things like this, right? Um, but you, you know, normally I would like, if I were to redo it, I would probably model the position as a position, which is a separate type from int such that the compiler would enforce that the position is a position, not an int, because int can be anything, but my positions are, have certain constraints. They can be from one to nine in, in the three by three game. And then if an int is outside of that range, that's not a position, right? So when I would be doing this, I would say maybe position. And then if I get the position back, I'm guaranteed that is within the range. And then here I would say board takes a position, and then I, again, I'm, I'm communicating that the position is within the particular range, right? Um, doing type ranges, like the, the, the type which has a constraint, like an int range is a little bit, um, like it could have been nicer in, in, in Haskell. Um, in languages like uh, Rust, it's even harder to, to kind of do it, but you know, maybe you, you can consider it. So then there is, uh, uh, many of you are checking like whether the cell is empty. So uh, there is a, like a, a function here, for example, uh, which checks um, for a, a particular int if the cell is empty, right? I have the same here. So I, I check, I, I use the list comprehension so I check, okay, for every cell that it's E, I kind of get the index of it. Um, so doing a list comprehension for all the empty positions, it's, um, it's probably the nicest. Yeah, I don't have any other examples of the uh, empty cells. All right, then rotation of the board. Um, that was kind of the, the tricky part because uh, that was harder to find online, like for the other tic-tac-toe constraints and uh, some of the data structures, you can get inspired by some other implementations. But with the rotation of the board, it was a little bit harder because it was harder to find something and you have to kind of invent your own, right? Um, so there is one uh, here, uh, which I, I really liked because I would never do it like this myself. But it works, right? Uh, so what, what it basically does, it, it has um, a swap list element uh, utility function, which takes a board, it takes two indexes and kind of uh, swaps though them around, right? Uh, and then the, the person is kind of uh, swapping the, the, the top corners, which you have to do before rotating the board and then swapping one with three and then swapping two with six and then swapping, you know, one with nine and, you know, it happens, right? Uh, so it is kind of, um, in, in a sense, it's quite beautiful, right? 
but again, like you have to repeat yourself so many times. Like I, at, at, at this bracket, I would stop already, right? I would say, uh, I'm doing it with map, right? So what I would do is I would map S to a list of those tuples and then do all those rotations like in a, in a map, right? Uh, because you kind of are doing the same thing over and over, you're just changing the data, right? So every time you, you're kind of doing something over and over, what do you do in, a, in Rust? You use a loop, right? Or you use some sort of um, um, fold or map. So it's the same here. Uh, what I would do is I would change uh, swap list elements to take a board. And instead of taking two parameters, I would say take a tuple of two integers. Uh, and then I would make a list of all those tuples and then say swap uh, like switch corners first. And then that would be my accumulator. And then I would do a fold on applying S to this accumulator and all those uh, tuples that I have in a list. And I would end up with a board which is kind of rotated, right? Um, but the logic is kind of nice. So, um, you know, you effectively need to rotate, like swap all those positions. Um, so there is another one um, which is using a pattern matching, right? So this person also represents uh, the board as a list. And then this person knows that after rotating left, the, you know, the position one, two, three, and so on will end up in a particular order. And it, it uses a pattern matching. So many of you did that. Many of you did the, uh, the pattern matching like this. Um, okay, uh, compared to this, uh, this is simpler and it's easier to understand and it's easier to, to see the logic, right? Um, and also this feels like it's a single operation, whereas this feels like, okay, it's a lot of operations that you have to do, right? Uh, so I, I probably like this more. What is the shortcoming of this one? Exactly. So I actually started like this and it, it was like uh, it, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> so I said, shit, there must be a better way. I mean, come on, there must be a better way of dealing with the, uh, with the list in such a way that you can rotate it uh, without um, hard coding the um, hard coding the size. So um, okay. So after like a couple of uh, sleepless you know nights, uh, I worked it out, and some of you did work it out as well. So you can use the uh, reverse and transpose to rotate the board left or right depending how you organize it. it like it took me a while to work it out on paper because the like the transpose is almost what you need, but it just gives you the kind of the board in the wrong kind of order. The columns are kind of messed up. Uh, but if you kind of use a piece of paper and kind of rotate it a couple of times, you 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 will come up with this solution, uh, and that is nicest, right? So th this one is um, mentally the most challenging because you kind of need to think about it. Uh, but once you work it out, it's kind of the nicest because it's the most concise and it deals with the arbitrary size of the, of the board. Uh, I'm not doing any checks here. So I'm kind of doing, uh, I'm only doing like, uh, because I have a size as a, as a con uh, constant. So I'm only checking if, I'm, if I given the, um, the correct size board to, to my function. Otherwise I, I return empty. Uh, but you could, you could skip that check. And if you gave it the wrong size, you just end up with some rubbish, right? Uh, but I wanted to detect that the, the, there was something going wrong. So, but, but that's wrong, right? I, I should not be doing like error handling here in this, in this place because then I'm doing two things. I'm doing error handling and I'm rotating the board, right? So I'm violating the single responsibility principle. I should be just doing the rotation. Um, all right, so then uh, swapping the corners, um, that is not super big deal. Um, so here we have uh, swap corners with a pattern. Uh, here we have swap corners with the indexes, right? Yeah, fine. Um, 
we have um, yeah swap corners with the patterns again and the rotation with the pattern. Um, yeah, nothing wrong with this, but it kind of is limited to the particular size. Um, and also you do need to kind of, uh, to, to make sure that this is correct will take some time, right? Uh, to make sure that this is correct. Uh, I mean, it is correct, right? Just by the logic of the operations. Whereas this one is, you could, could have made a typo and then the typo might have introduced a, an error. Um, all right, uh, checking if the if the board is a winning or losing, that that was kind of problematic also, right? Uh, most of the code is ugly like hell. <laughs> um, yeah, well, what can we say? That that is a hard problem, right? Uh, there, there was one which I've seen, but I don't have it here, which actually used the logic of columns and rows and diagonals and kind of uh, checked if the columns, uh, and then you can use the same for transpose, right? So you can check the rows and then you can transpose and check the rows again, right? Uh, so there is there are some kind of a tricks that you could do, uh, but I kind of gave up as well. So I, I didn't do it nice and I did it kind of like um, in a, yeah, I mean, uh, what, what I don't like here is that you, it's a little bit hard to validate if this is correct, right? For example, there is a lot of text, the indexes are here, but it's really hard to say, is this implementation correct or not, right? Uh, same with this one. Uh, they are doing what needs to be done, but it's really uh, hidden of what actually is happening, right? So this implementation is not much better than those because um, it's limited to a particular size of the board and it, it is kind of ugly, but at least it's easier to validate that the rows and columns are kind of encoded here, right? Um, so to kind of validate the horizontal, vertical, and diagonal, it's a little bit easier. And I've seen uh, yeah, like this one, for example. So again, there is a lot of repetition, right? So if you extract the indexes uh, into some sort of tuples, then you could do all of that with a, a simpler call where all the boilerplate is kind of extracted away, right? Um, but that's still problematic. Like the nicest way would be to be able to deal with the variable size boards and with the rows and columns and diagonals kind of as rows, columns and diagonals, right? Uh, but I, I haven't done it myself either. Uh, the, the, the reason was I just uh, wanted something to work and I wanted like to do it later and I never did it. Like I never refactored it. Uh, but those uh, are examples of what you guys did. And it's similar, but it's a little bit less readable. Like this is a little bit more readable. So you could refactor that into similar structure, uh, but try to extract the, the data out of it such that it's easy, easier to validate. Okay, so winning conditions. Okay, and then uh, the main core logic of the, of the game. So. This is an, an implementation which is only dealing with the uh, player versus, uh, human versus human uh, situation. And then it's reasonably compact because you only have one case to deal with. Um, this one is uh, the situation where you're dealing with, um, yeah, the two different uh, operations like uh, for one player or for the other player. Um, what is wrong with this one? Can you spot a bug? So in, in terms of implementation, it's fine. Like uh, I also did the pattern matching on the particular situation of the board to have a uh, different logic. Uh, so if you every time you can avoid doing if statement or case statement by uh, pattern matching, it's a little bit better because it's a bit more readable. Um, you know, if we can avoid that, that would be nice, but uh, that is a bit harder. Um, so there is no problem with, with this, but there is like uh, a bug. So what, what is it?
So, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a bug because I, I, I didn't fully analyze it. Uh, I suspect it's not a bug, it's just a... Uh, um, so let, let's, let's think about it. So, um, um, all right. So I don't know if when, uh, when this, let, let's assume that when this method, uh, makes the move, um, we place X, right? So we just placed X on the board. Uh, and then we checking if uh, X is the winner here, right? Um, and then we disregard, we kind of don't do anything with this message because in the next line we say, okay, uh, take the message if the O is the winner, right? So we kind of ignored um, that check. So either that check is not needed because we doing it and, and ignoring it, or that check uh, is not what we think it is. Uh, so th there is something weird going on with those two lines of code because the first one is never used, right? The first one is kind of ignored. Sorry? Yeah, it is changing. So it's all shadowing the message, right? I, I was surprised as well that the compiler didn't complain because it should. Um, but yeah, so th this is the same here. Uh, yeah, so dealing with the game logic and organizing the, um, the way you deal with the different cases uh, kind of depends on the on how you uh, split the, the logic inside your code. And some of you didn't split it a lot such that you end up with, uh, so for example, um, yeah, that, that one is quite nice. Um, yeah, I don't have, there was a, an example I had where the game loop was a very, very complex because the person was dealing with all the checks in a single function. So it, it had a kind of a, a very complex nested structure with a lot of case and if statements, right? Uh, yes, it would work, but it would make really hard to kind of uh, reason about and very hard to kind of um, modify, right? Uh, this one is quite nice. Uh, it splits the cases for uh, making a human moves, uh, making the, um, no, that's, uh, that's already a different one. Yeah, so th this one is um, making, uh, human versus program or program versus program move. And then the logic of the random number generator is kind of here. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of like the more modular approach such that you kind of refactor it into smaller functions and then you compose kind of a harder, like more complex behavior out of the smaller functions. Um, and most of you didn't refactor the, um, like for example, the, uh, yeah, so here is the, the random number choice. Um, most of the ones that I've checked kind of correctly uh, did the valid spots. So you either have the, uh, the valid ind indices or in some way you kind of extracted what are the empty slots and then you, you randomized from that. that that's a, a good way of doing it. Uh, but it is part of the, of the logic here. Uh, maybe it should be extracted away. Maybe it should be a separate function uh, to generate the move. And that's what I, that's what I did. Um, I have this, um, I take the, the con context and then I return the move and then the move is used, right? So here I would kind of uh, call that function, I, I would get the move and then the move would be kind of applied. Uh, but how the move was generated is kind of extracted away. It's hidden behind the interface, right? So like whether I randomly got the move or whether I did something more fancy, it would be kind of uh, you know, uh, separate. So here I have two, um, two implementations. One, it just generates a random move uh, doesn't do anything fancy. So it, yeah, it uh, generates a random location and then the random rotation, right? Um, 
And then this one is a bit more complex uh, where I do kind of a look ahead. So I, I check for all the possible moves that I can make. Is there any winning move? And then if there is, I will take it. And then if um, from all the moves that I can take, none of them is winning for me, then I do the same check for the opponent. Because if the next move for the opponent is a winning one, I have to put my X or zero to that move such that that person cannot make that move, right? Um, so it, it basically does this uh, kind of logic here. So it checks if my next move is a winning one, then I want to take it. And then it checks, okay, if the opponent's move is a winning one, then I want to take that one. And then if neither of that is the case, then I check if the middle position is empty. Uh, and I uh, hard coded the number here. So mm, very bad. Uh, I, I have a constant for a middle board position, but I didn't use it. Uh, yeah, I have it here, uh, board center position. Uh, so I, if uh, the, the board center position is empty, then I take it. Otherwise, I will take the random move. Uh, you will see that there is kind of a nesting here. Um, and that nesting is not nice, right? So I have uh, two levels of nesting, three, three levels of nesting. Um, and that is typically what we want to avoid. Uh, and one way uh, that you can avoid it is like here I had also, um, I had uh, three levels of nesting or, or one, two, three. Yeah, with the um, check if it is um, possible to, to, um, to win, because I need to check if I can win by making that move, or if I can win by making that move and rotating left, or if I can win by moving that, making that move and rotating right. So I have to do three checks, right? And then by doing the three checks, one after the other, it gets this kind of a nested uh, pyramid of doom, right? Um, Okay, three is not the end of the world. You can nest to three things, but and, and it's like, it, it will not grow, right? Because I can only do those three things. I can win by making a move, win by making a move and rotating left or, or rotating right. I mean, that's the closed domain, right? But even with three, that gets a bit repetitive and that gets a little bit uh, tedious, uh, such that it would be nicer if I can do those three checks like in a, uh, in a sequence, right? So here I'm doing them in a sequence. So I'm checking if I can win without rotation. Here I can check if I can win with the rotating left. And here I can, I, I'm checking if I uh, win with rotating right. And the, the solution is that I shortcut. So if, if this one kind of fails, I quit, right? I don't do subsequent checks. And because I'm kind of operating with the uh, with a particular um, context, I can kind of shortcut my, my sequence. And you can do that with maybe, you can do that with uh, either, you can kind of uh, do that with some other um, mon monadic compositions such that the moment you kind of are doing something and, and it's succeeding, you're continuing. But if something kind of fails, you're not continuing, you're kind of going out, right? Uh, it's kind of like break from a loop in normal programming. Uh, so this is an example of how I refactored this uh, with three nested ifs into single case uh, because I will shortcut this and I will not continue the sequence when one of them goes left, right? So in any, uh, I'm using either here. So uh, uh, check, check when with the role returns either and either will kind of shortcut the moment you get left. So the moment you go to right, you continue because it's considered like the, the correct path. But the moment you get left, it is considered the error or some kind of a quit condition such that you go out. So the moment I, I go left, so my, my left is the, the next move that it is a winning move. My right, I don't care, right? So if, if I don't have the winning move, I don't care and I return nothing. So here I continue if I got nothing, I continue if I got nothing and I continue if I got nothing. So then if I continue and I got nothing because the right is the kind of a continued path, I, I say, okay, um, I recheck it 
for the next move, right? Um, hey, Tom. Yeah, we're finishing, 10 o'clock. All right, so um, that's kind of an example of how you can restructure this kind of a nested structures into something that is a little bit more linear. And it's the same um, with, um, yeah, so th that one was simple. Like if you have a, just a single case, yeah, you can really make it simpler than a single case. If you have a single case with some subcases or some if statements, and it's nested more than twice, you can probably kind of refactor it. Um, so here we have um, kind of uh, three nesting of the case. So we, we have uh, one with nothing, uh, and then we have a second, and potentially you can kind of flatten that out into a sequence, right? Um, I have a rule of thumb that if I have nesting more than two, I start thinking about it. And then if I have more than three, you probably should refactor it, right? Um, you will notice that I refactored three into one. So it's not like you can kind of get rid of it. Sometimes you can, like if you have uh, like this error validation that we had for a student, you can kind of shortcut it and you just have a flat do statements, right? So you have a single do and then you have some sequence. And then if any of them fails, you kind of quit, right? Uh, but sometimes you have to do some extra things. So here I have to recurse. So that's why I, I do need at least one. All right, so that's it. Um, that was a bit of a uh, code review session for the assignment. I will try to finish my, uh, my checking of all your submissions and give you a little bit of feedback. Um, the submission system doesn't, um, I've noticed that you haven't used extensively the reviews. So some of you didn't kind of uh, got a lot of reviews uh, and um, you, you should kind of use it. Like you should look at somebody else's code and kind of uh, provide, provide reviews. So uh, try, I, I, I encourage you to do that for the second assignment. And I will probably use the same mechanism to give you feedback. I, I haven't worked it out yet how I will do it, but I will um, give you for the assignment a little bit of a comments. Say it again. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. So do you have any comments? Do you have any feedback? Do you think it's doable? Is it too hard? I think it's doable, but you know, I don't know what you think. Uh, Yeah. Okay, so the actual implementation details are kind of left out, like the way you want to structure it and the way you want to do it is a little bit up to you. Uh, the behavior I can I can make the behavior a bit more precise. Yes. So I can give examples of short programs and what is expected to be the outcome. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, so open an issue. Like if there is some suggestions or some uh, feedback, just give me some feedback and then I will remove that in the review. So it's in the review because I, I didn't freeze it yet. If there are some mistakes or some things you want to be changed, uh, let me know. I had a session with Carl and we discussed it a little bit and we kind of agreed that it should work. The most of the basics are kind of okay. Uh, handling with the lists might be a little bit harder, but I think it's, it's still doable. Um, and then you can, I can, um, I posted some of the state monad uh, um, suggestions and that would be useful. So the way I'm dealing with AI here, for example, is using the, um, the state. So, um, yeah, I'm using the um, state for uh, managing the 
this uh, transitions of the calculations such that I can kind of do a more imperative style. I can use this do notation and kind of organize my uh, actions like sequen in, into sequences. And that is helpful. Uh, so you may consider doing that as well um, for the second assignment, yeah. All right, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much. And um, if you have any feedback or any comments, just yeah, put, put, the, put that into the issue tracker. All right.